Okay, well, it's uh, time. Welcome, everyone. Um, it's my very great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Professor Dirk de Ridder. Uh, Professor de Ridder is the inaugural uh, Neurological Foundation Professor of Neurosurgery in University of Otago. And so, um, who better to talk about his topic tonight, the history of neurosurgery? Thank you, Professor Thank you. de Ridder. So, um, first of all, I'm not a historian, so it'll be uh, not a real academic approach to the history of neurosurgery. But uh, my mother is a historian, and she always explained to me that ultimately you want to study the past in order to kind of be able to predict the future, um, which is not a new idea. It goes back to Confucius already a very long time ago. Now, neurosurgery sounds like it's a, like it's a very recent discipline in, um, in medicine, but um, James Goodrich actually disagrees, and he says that it has often been said that the two oldest living professions are prostitution and neurosurgery. I would assume that the ancient war warrior realized very early on that it was the easiest way to annihilate or at least slow down his opponent with a blow to the head. Therefore, the concept of head injuries remains as Asian as the powers of solicitation of the opposite sex. Which means that if this is correct, then we should have some evidence for that. And indeed, it has the oldest uh, trephined or trepanated um, skulls date back to 10,000 BC, which is, uh, which is a very uh, long time ago. And what is very interesting from that concept, it means that if they were treating the head or the brain, that disease was not considered supernatural, which has, for which it has been considered very long time, and that it can be treated. So this dates back already to the Mesolithic uh, time period, which is, uh, which is very old. In France, they also uh, found very old skulls, as in China. So it was universal, but probably the most well-known um, skulls were the Inca skulls. And um, they, these have been studied very well from multiple sites. And it has been assumed that um, the Inca Inca trepanations were done with, uh, with either obsidian or, or volcanic rock or even with um, ornament, uh, very ornamented bronze um, tools. The reason why these skulls were trepanated is not known. It has been suggested that it was done for epilepsy, for headaches, uh, for infections and trauma. But most likely, trauma was the major cause. Uh, because most reference skull, uh, skulls were young males, about 73% of all the skulls that have been found were young males, and most of these skulls were, um, had trepanations on the left anterior frontal side and on the midline, which, of course, if your opponent, um, who's fighting for the same woman, uses his right hand, he will hit you on the left side of the head. So, the, um, and Hippocrates, uh, a lot later, he noticed that um, the localization of brain injuries were mostly close to the midline, that these um, injuries actually had the worst prognosis, which is not that uh, strange because on the midline in your brain there is a superior sagittal sinus which drains all your blood from your brain to one big highway that then carries the blood to the back and then to the heart. So if you damage this, there is no way that the blood can move out of your brain, your brain will swell, and basically because your brain is sitting in a closed box, you will die. So um, this was noted by Hippocrates, and then the, the second uh, worst prognosis was temporal injuries for the same reason, that if you hit somebody on a temporal lobe, it will swell, it will compress your, um, your brain stem, which controls your heart rate and your um, breathing, and you will die fairly quickly as well. Occipital lesions, on the other hand, seem to, ferry, seem to have the best prognosis. And apparently, intuitively, the Inca warriors already seemed to know what that, that it was very good to hit somebody in the midline and as well in the temporal um, area. Because if you see, if you look at the distribution of trepanations, most of the trepanations were either on the left or on the midline with very few on the right side, suggesting that it might indeed be uh, trauma-related, 
and that they knew that if you really wanted to hit somebody badly, that the midline or the temporal lobe on the left was a, a good place to go to. Now, if you look at this trepanation, what is interesting, it's on the midline, it's right on this big signs, and this, this lesion shows no signs of healing, suggesting that they might have hit this uh, sinus and that the patient died during the surgery. Now, on the other hand, the worst place to go is to go to the posterior part of the sinus because that drains the whole brain, basically. And interestingly, this, this uh, lesion shows signs of bony healing. It's not very sharp. It's a little bit demarcated, which means that this patient survived the surgery, which is very uh, intriguing because if you, go, if, you make, if you just go a little bit too deep, you hit that sinus, it's very difficult to control the bleeding, and it is usually associated with um, perioperative uh, mortality. So these, this means that those uh, Inca surgeons or neurosurgeons were very skilled. Now, it was not a rare thing to do those, in, um, to do those um, craniotomies. Most of them had only one big hole and of course as you can see it's on the on the left side frontally so probably from a right-handed opponent um, but some had more holes up to seven different holes which have different times of healing for example this this thing is nicely healed so that was an old lesion whereas this one is not healed so maybe this um, whatever he was if he was a warrior he survived the first attack but probably the second was not as beneficial for his uh, surgical treatment. So most of them had just one uh, craniotomy, um, and it was not that rare. In certain burial grounds, they found up that up to 35% of the skulls were actually uh, trephined, um, which means that it was a common practice. Now, based on the fact whether they, they were healing or not, you can deduce whether what was the mortality rate of those people or how good were those neurosurgeons um, at that time. And what is even more amazing is that some of these skulls actually did they perform the craniopalasty, which means that they used gold in order to create a filling in of the bone which has nicely healed, meaning that um, the patient survived not all of that, but that the, the, bo the hole was protected, and to be honest, we can't do that anymore. We're not as good as these, um, as these Inca neurosurgeons in creating such a nice healed uh, craniotomy. We use cement, we use titanium plates, but in order to obtain this, that's a very difficult uh, thing to do. Now, based on these um, healings, uh, uh, by the amount of healing, it has been uh, calculated that in uh, 1400 uh, AD, with those Inca, Inca neurosurgeons, about 83% of the people who were treated survived, which is, which is very good. Because if you go back to the 1900s, 50% mortality was considered normal in neurosurgery. Of course, we don't know whether these people, whether they were just staying outside the dura which covers the brain, or whether they were really going inside the brain to do these uh, surgical approaches. Now that's all prehistory. History starts when people start writing about the brain and writing about neurosurgery. And um, the first time that the brain is used in, um, in writing is, uh, this is uh, the, the hieroglyph that uh, depicts brain. And it, um, it is found eight times in the Edwin Smith surgical papyrus in which um, 27, 27 of the 48 described cases were related to treatment for uh, brain trauma and uh, brain infections and six for spine uh, infections. So it's the first surgical um, book, really, that tells how to treat brain injury and spine injury. Um, the way the papyrus is, is built up is that for every case, there is a title, an examination of the clinical symptoms, a diagnosis, and a treatment. However, uh, in, with, with these Egyptian uh, papyri, there is no mentioning of uh, performing a craniotomy in contrast to what you saw 
and the early uh, French and um, early North African uh, craniotomies. Probably this, um, this manuscript goes back to an older work written by Imhotep, who by some uh, people like uh, William Osler, a famous uh, general surgeon, has been described as the father of um, medicine. So basically the first time in history that we know the, the brain is treated and that it's written down how dates back probably to um, the third millennium before um, Christ. Early, early neurosurgery was limited, but um, Hippocrates already suggested, going back to the, to the quote of prostitution and neurosurgery, that if you want to become a surgeon, you should just follow the troops, because that's where you find most casualties, and that's where you can learn um, you, how to perform these kinds of surgery. Then, uh, um, a couple of hundred years later, Celsus seemed to have been the uh, sole Roman neurosurgeon, and um, he was basically treating gladiators, so he had some experience in treating um, brain trauma. After that, um, most of the knowledge goes back to Islamic medicine, and then there was a very long period where there was basically no evolution in what could be called early neurosurgery. And the problem was that in order to perform neurosurgery, there is a couple of um, problematic issues. One is that there was not sufficient neuroscientific knowledge. One didn't even know whether the brain was important for the mind. Aristotle, for example, said, no, the mind is caused by the heart, and the brain just cools down the whole body. That's the function of the brain. Whereas some other people, like Plato, said, no, no, it's the, the, the brain is the, soul, is, the, is the source of the soul or the mind. The anatomy of the brain was not known. Uh, functions in the brain one could not localize very well. And then there were some surgical problems, especially how to control pain, because anesthesia was not um, really used at that moment yet, and that most uh, many uh, people died of infections because one didn't have an antibiotics, one didn't even know what a septic uh, treatment meant. So for a long time, therefore, there was no real uh, surgery performed on the brain. The Greeks um, were trying to solve this first problem of what is, is the brain really important for the mind? Is the brain controlling our mind and our body? Some of the Greeks, like Aristotle, uh, Democritus, the Stoics, Epicurus, and uh, Empedocles, said, no, it's the heart. It's the heart that controls the mind, that generates the mind, or, um, as um, Aristotle would call it, the soul. Whereas others, uh, such as Pythagoras, Plato, Hippocrates, uh, Herophilus, um, Erastitratis, and Galen, they said, no, it's the brain. And interestingly, um, these were, uh, um, for example, Hippocrates, Herophilus, Erastratus, and Galen, they were medical doctors at that time, whereas the other ones were more, were more philosophers. So the doctors probably had more real life experience in seeing that if you damage the brain, that there was something wrong with the people. And what was interesting is that in Alexandra, that, that was the only place where the sections were performed. And according to Herophilus, who was um, who is called the father of Western theology, and Celsus, actually um, uh, Herophilus vivisected 600 uh, prisoners. So when you were a prisoner, you ran the risk of being dissected while you were alive which of course gives a lot of information, but is probably not very um, ethically um, acceptable anymore. In Roman, in Roman times, dissections were abolished. There were no more dissections, so the anatomy of the brain was not very well known because dissections were not allowed. And, and Galen, actually, he dissected monkeys, which created problems hundreds of years later because the whole anatomy during the Middle Ages was based on these dissections of Galen, um, who had written a book uh, because he had integrated Herophilus and Eristratus um, dissections which were performed in Alexandra and uh, added to that his uh, dissected monkey work and what he, um, what he learned from uh, treating gladiators. And that was the reference 
for anatomy of the brain until the 16th and the 17th century. So basically, until, until the 16th and the 17th century, our brains were considered monkey brains for who was looking at the anatomy of the brain. Then, with the development of universities in Paris and Bologna, um, in Oxford uh, and Padua, etc., um, there was a new interest in anatomy, and, and thus also in anatomy of the brain. And interestingly, the, uh, Frederick II actually made it mandatory for every surgeon and every physician to, uh, to be present at a dissection. And because it took five years to become a surgeon or, or, um, or a physician, these dissections had to be performed at least once every five years, so people could go to see those dissections. Now these, and therefore, for example, in 1315, the first um, public dissection on the market square was on, uh, on a prisoner was being performed by uh, Mondino di Liuzzi, um, which uh, followed the way Gallen had proposed the dissections to be. So there was one, one um, person, the anatomist, who was basically reading Gallen's work, um, and then there was one barber um, who would do the dissection, and then one ostenser who would just point at what the, um, the person, the anatomist, would say the anatomy was like. But they were still following um, Gallen, and if the anatomy didn't fit with, the, uh, with what Gallen said, they believed Gallen, not the real um, anatomy, until Vesalius came because he performed the dissections himself. Being an anatomist, who normally was only reading, he did the dirty work himself and um, basically started disagreeing with Gallen and said, yeah, but what he describes, I don't see that. And this is why Vesalius is so important for learning about, uh, about the anatomy. Now, from an anatomical point of view, those dissections after Vesalius really gave some information about the brain looks like macroscopically. But microscopically, it was unknown. And it, lost, and it, and it took till the 1840s uh, um, when there was an idea that basically all organisms were made up of cells which had already been proposed earlier on by Democritus, but, and, and the cell theory actually excluded the brain. So the whole body was made of cells except our brain. And then um, uh, 30 years uh, later, von Gerlach describes actually that the nervous system is one single large network, which is called the reticular theory. So our whole nervous system would be one, one cobweb that is connected uh, to everything, but it is basically one big cell. Now, Golgi um, invented, uh, interestingly, a silver stain of the brain, and based on the staining, he confirmed this reticular theory. So, even though now we could look at the brain at, at, uh, in a microscopic way, um, it actually he came to what is now known to be the wrong conclusion. And Cajal, on the other hand, he used the same method that Golgi had created to describe individual neurons. And so Cajal said, no, the brain is, fit, is made up of single cells, whereas Golgi confirmed von Gerlach and said, no, it's one, basically one big reticular network. So you've got two opposite, um, opposite ideas and because both seemed so good, actually they shared a Nobel Prize for opposite theories in 1906. So you can be completely wrong and still get the Nobel Prize. And, and it's only till uh, when the electron microscope was developed in the 1950s that it was really proven that um, Cajal was right and that uh, Golgi was probably wrong. Now, this is an anatomy whereas the function of the brain was still largely unknown. And Franz Gall came up with an idea, which is called phrenology, that actually the brain consists of different organs or different modules. And that there was, um, in humans, there were 27 of these different modules, all with a different function. So one part of the brain would be related to aggressiveness, another part 
to uh, love another part, to hard work, etc. And what he thought well, is, well, if the brain is similar to the rest of the body, then when we do physical exercises and we train our muscles, our muscles become big. Now, if this is the same in the brain, then when somebody is aggressive, for example, the brain, that part of the brain will become hypertrophic, the skull will actually be pushed outward, and so based on this abnormal skull um, bumps, we can measure those with a kind of a craniometer and just say, well, this person is going to be aggressive, this person is going to be very smart, this person is going to be whatever. So the skull was used as an outer representation of hypertrophy, of hypotrophy, of certain modules in the brain. Of course, we now know that this is wrong, but the idea that the brain was built up of different modules was actually a very interesting idea. So the idea was that the brain is indeed the organ of the mind, that the brain is built up out of different modules, different parts, each with a different function, and that these modules are topographically or localized. So for everybody, uh, aggression is located in a certain part, love is located in another part, um, intelligence in still another part, and you can, these are topographically organized. And therefore, um, the skull, measuring the skull, uh, can help you in basically uh, creating a cartography of the person's personality um, based on what you measure. So, which, which leads to an interesting um, idea from anatomy, we, there was, in, up to the 1870s, there was still some doubt, well, is it one cell or one reticular network or are they separate cells, um, the Golgi versus, uh, versus uh, Cajal um, idea. And of course, this is important because in globalism, which is from a psychological point of view, you had the same two theories. So one theory, called globalism was basically related as, um, was based on the anatomy of the reticular system, whereas localizationism was, um, was based on, um, on the idea that there is different cells, that those cells group together, and that when they group together, they have a different function. So one, uh, the globalism focused on, con um, on basically connections, which we now know is very important, whereas the other one, the other theory, was actually more specifying segregation. Different modules have, are located in different uh, parts of the brain and have different functions. And now actually we know that in reality, the current knowledge says that both are right. So maybe it was not that bad that Cajal and Golgi got the Nobel Prize together for opposite theories, because now we know that actually it's a combination of the two. Now, Napoleon himself, he was bothered by this idea of, um, of, um, of phrenology. And so he asked um, Jean-Pierre Flourens to prove or disprove the, the concept of phrenology, whether the brain was indeed built up of different modules and that these different modules had different functions and were localized at a specific part of the brain. So he used animal experiments to, throw, uh, uh, to actually prove already that, well, if you damage the brain, you damage different functions, so that indeed um, what the Greeks were, were discussing is that the mind is localized in the brain and not in the heart. And that different functions are topographical modules, except for memory and cognition. So they took animals and cut out a little bit of the brain, did uh, memory experiments, to cut out another little part of the brain, did memory experience, and at the end, Lashley basically said, memory doesn't exist because I can't cut it out of, the, out of the brain, and that's of course because memory is distributed and can compensate if you remove only part of the brain, whereas if you remove the motor cortex, then your contralateral um, limb phase um, and lower and upper limb will become uh, plegic. So therefore, um, the idea was that there is something like phrenology um, that exists. Now, one of the first well, very well-known case, uh, cases is the idea of, um, is what happened to Phineas Gage, who was working on a railroad, and most of you might know the story, um, 
uh, using um, explosives and while he was pushing the explosive into a hole actually they exploded and and the big rod went through his um, through his cheek and came out on the top of the skull damaging a, a part of his um, of the brain that uh, transversed remarkably he survived the only thing that's changed was his personality and so this already suggested that actually some parts of your personality are located in a specific part of your brain. And then a couple of years later, uh, Broca uh, discovered that a patient who had a brain abscess in this area lost expressive speech. Um, and when the patient died, um, they did an autopsy and basically found that probably motor speech should be located in that area. And then Wernicke in Germany said, well, it's strange, I don't see always this lesion showing up in patients who have a more sensory aphasia, meaning they can speak very well, but they don't understand what you're saying, and that was more located to an area posteriorly. So it took up to the 1870s before people knew a little bit of localizing where functions were in the brain. And this is, of course, a requirement for a neurosurgeon to kind of safely intervene inside the brain, because we don't know whether those old trepanations from 10,000 BC on, whether they really went into the brain or not. So the localization in the brain up to the end of the 1800s was basically not very well known, um, and it was only by looking at autopsies of people who had lesions or trauma that people could start to say, well, probably this function is located there in the brain and this function is located over there, until electrical stimulation was developed. And the first one to use that was uh, Bartolo in, 18, in 1870, so about the same time as Wernicke was um, finding out where the uh, sensory uh, speech area was. And he was the first to use electrical stimuli during surgery to try and figure out where the motor cortex was. And um, he, could, he could reliably stimulate the brain so that the patient would move the contralateral um, arm and foot. Unfortunately, the patient did die after the first surgery in which this electrical stimulation was performed. And then later uh, on, people like Penfield actually made whole maps of the brain uh, just by stimulating those people uh, during surgery and then noting systematically where every function but of course, predominantly of the sensory and the motor uh, cortex and uh, also auditory cortex and visual cortex was located. So slowly but certainly, the localizationism became, became better known. Now, those new techniques such as electrical stimuli are interesting. Now, if you develop a new technique, then you have to take some risks. As I, as I mentioned, the first electrical stimuli, stimuli that were given um, in surgery by Bartolo unfortunately resulted in the patient dying. But if you, if, you ex if you are an explorer in surgery, then you have to take risks, just like the first people who crossed um, through Africa, uh, basically not knowing on beforehand what they were going to encounter. And if you take risks, then of course you have to except that there is going to be some resistance, which is not just in, in exploring uh, countries, it's also with new ideas. And Thomas Kuhn has nicely described that in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, where he talks about paradigm shifts, where a paradigm is basically the general um, accepted explanation uh, for something. And that actually science wants to improve um, paradigms and, and neuroscience as well. And that this trying to improve or confirm what is being said does not um, search for something new. And this is what we see with, um, with the dissections who were following Gallen and they were not looking for disproving Gallen. They would just say, well, Gallen must be right and that's uh, what, we're, what we're going to do. Now, according to Thomas Kuhn, who was a physicist, he said, well, the more in detail one researches the paradigm, the more likely it is that one doesn't find that all data fit, which is what um, Vesalius encountered. He said, yeah, but what I see here myself when I do this doesn't fit with what is the current paradigm, which is 
uh, the anatomy according to Galen. And therefore, the accepted rules become vague and uh, people like Vesalius deviated from the paradigm and develop a new model of anatomy, for example, um, and this is then called the scientific revolution. And the best model um, that explains the data survives. So basically it's the survival of the fittest model for the explanation of what, um, what is under investigation. So science is nothing else than a kind of a Darwinian evolutionary approach of developing new ideas, contrasting them with other ideas, and the, the most fitting uh, explanation is the one that will survive. Usually, these, um, these uh, new ideas come from young people who are new in the field, which is a little bit problematic because uh, many scientists are against a new idea. First of all, it's a young person who's new in the field. What should he know or sh what, should, what should she know? I mean, it's just a young person having a crazy idea because the young person doesn't know the entire history, doesn't know um, what it's all about. And some specialists actually then accept a new model based on belief because there's no proof yet, it's just a new idea and, um, and it's the beauty of the idea and then perform normal science. They try to confirm the new model. However, most people initially will be against the new idea and, uh, but ultimately, if the idea is better, if it, it will survive and it will become the newly accepted paradigm. Now for innovation, according to Thomas Kuhn, it starts with a new idea. And the new idea is then driving the innovation in science. Whereas Peter Gallison, also a physicist, says the opposite. Well, no, it's not the new ideas, it's first new technology. It's if you have new technology, that will lead to a new idea, and then that's what you have in science. So probably, I would assume it's an interaction of the two. When you have new technology, that might allow you to get a new idea. For example, well, when Golgi developed the Golgi stain, one could look at the brain in a different way. His interpretation was wrong, but, but then Cajal, looking, using the same stain, using the same new technology, said, well, no, I think it's the cell theory is right. So for neurosurgery, all these new ideas were critically important because if you want to operate in the brain, you have to know more or less, where, first of all, where you are in the brain and what's wrong with the brain. So for example, in 1895, um, up to 1895, the only means of understanding the brain was based on understanding what the lesion caused as a problem and then waiting till the person dies, do an autopsy and then see well this correlates to the symptom. Now in 1895 the x-ray was developed and within a year the, the first one, the, one of the first neurosurgeons uh, in the US, Cushing, Harvey Cushing, used it already to localize a bullet. Their new technology allows the development of neurosurgery in a certain way. And then another, uh, in 1913, um, a surgeon discovers ventricula uh, ventriculography accidentally. Basically, in the middle of the brain, you've got ventricles, and there was a patient who was um, hit by a trolley car, just like Gaudi before he died, and um, he air entered his brain and got into the ventricles, and this was, this was easily to be seen on, the, on a skull X-ray. And then an, a neurosurgeon um, by the name of Dandy said, well, why don't we use this? Why don't I just take a syringe with air, inject it into those ventricles, and then we can see better whether they deviate, for example, if there is a tumor. Uh, and so the ventriculography was developed based on an incidental finding of a patient who had a trauma, um, and that was just practically applied a little later. Then they started injecting uh, basically contrast into the, into the spinal cord and into the ventricles as well so they could see on the x-ray um, where there was abnormalities in contrast to what normal x-ray with, um, with contrast would look like. And then um, Egas Monitz, who later got the Nobel Prize for his lobotomies, basically he was the guy who developed angiography where they would puncture the carotid directly 
inject the same kind of contrast and then take pictures of the blood vessels of the brain, which would give still extra information. <coughs> so, uh, and then in the 70s, the CT scan was developed, and in the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, the MRI scan, which is what we now routinely use. So all these new de techniques, technologies, allowed neurosurgeons to better see what was going on in the brain, and which could then help to uh, see whether treatment was beneficial or not. So scientific knowledge of the anatomy and the localization was improved by technological advancements. But there were still some surgical problems, namely the pain. Pain <coughs> that uh, patients had, so we, you need anesthesia and infections. Uh, many patients died because of post-operative infections and uh, nobody really wanted to be operated because of the, of the pain of the surgery, even though the brain itself is not, is not, very, uh, is not sensitive to, uh, to the painful stimuli. Because there was no anesthesia, it was the general idea was that a good surgeon is a fast surgeon. The faster you could operate, the better you were, because patients suffered pain for only a very short time. Not only that, it not only did it reduce pain, it also reduced mortality, because, well, in a certain, in a short time, except if you hit the sexual signs in the brain, or if you hit the carotid, usually you have um, less time to bleed to death. And it also reduced mortality due to infection. What we have noticed, and that is still the case today, so we know, for example, if you put in ventricular peritoneal shunts, where you want to drain a buildup of water in the brain, that the infection rate is directly correlated with the duration of the surgery. So in a certain way, the old adagio of a fast surgeon is a good surgeon, is still not completely gone. But predominantly, it was to reduce uh, pain. And of course, everybody wants then to know, well, who was the fastest surgeon in the world? And that was Robert Liston. <coughs> Robert Liston is this, is this person that you see here. And he, was, uh, he started as an anatomist. So he knew his anatomy very well, which of course helped him to do amputation. So he knew where to do an amputation. And he initiated every operation by now, gentlemen, timing. I'm a fast surgeon, and I know I'm very fast. And he was capable of amputating even a hip at the level of the hip within 30 seconds and uh, close the wounds within two minutes. So within two minutes and 30 seconds, the surgery was finished. So he was really fast. Um, but interestingly, he was the first to use general anesthesia, which means you don't need to be fast anymore because under general anesthesia, the patients have no pain. So you can take your time. So basically, he killed his own reputation by using anesthesia, which allowed um, him to be still very fast, but it was not really necessary anymore. Now, there is an interesting story that pushed into legend. And that is that he was, um, apart from being interested in hydrocephalus from a neurosurgical point of view, he was uh, the only surgeon known to have a 300% mortality in one surgery. The way he, what happened is, so there was usually an assistant, because there was no anesthesia, just to hold the patient to the table while you would cut of his leg, that he cut through the assistant's finger, and the, and the assistant died of an infection afterwards. But while cutting, actually, he, he, he cut through the, the clothing of somebody who was watching, who actually fainted and had a cardiac attack and died as well. So that was already 200% mortality. And then, unfortunately, the patient died as well. So he's the only one. And this all within a couple of minutes. This pushed him to really to a legendary status that he was so fast that you had to be very careful if you were in his neighborhood. <laughs> but luckily, there was in the 19th century, there was a revolution of the triple A, meaning that in 1846, anesthesia was developed, uh, and antisepsis was developed, meaning that you could remove uh, microbes from the skin and surgical instruments, and a sepsis was developed. And this really changed surgery dramatically. At that time, the patient could be asleep, so you could take your time to operate. Um, the, also, the risk of infection was decreased, which was also related to the timing of the surgery. Um, so, uh, because of antisepsis and asepsis. So the first thing that is important is anesthesia. Now anesthesia was actually already a little bit known in the sense that alcohol was already known in prehistoric times. So probably those people who were treated 
um, by scraping off the, the, because most of the time they were just <coughs> using obsidian, where they were scraping off parts of the skull um, or uh, under influence of alcohol. And that, was, that might have been a coincidental finding. For example, if you go on safari now, you will see that uh, when the fruit gets very ripe, elephants will go to get to these fruits to get drunk. So it's probably an incidental finding that they knew, well, if you eat these, um, these foods that stay too long in trees, uh, you get drunk and then you can more easily do a trepanation. Now, opium is also very old. It was already cultivated in Sumeria and in, uh, in Mesopotamia in, uh, in uh, 3400 BC and actually also was used in surgery in Egypt in uh, 1500 BC as written on an Eber's um, papyrus, another papyrus. And um, hyacin, which is biscopan, which is an antispasmodic uh, pain-reducing medication, was also very old. So people already knew how to use some kinds of painkillers in surgery a long time ago. But the major breakthrough came in this uh, 19th century revolution when um, ether, chloroform, and uh, nitrogen oxide uh, were developed. And also, this was actually an incidental finding, like most in medicine is. Um, Sir Humphrey Davy was using uh, nitrous oxide himself for euphoria, and that was you. That was common. Um, they were called the laughing. It was called laughing gas, and it was used at parties. Instead of drinking a glass of champagne, they would just get a little high on nitrous oxide, and he noticed that it had uh, painkilling effects. So he said, "Well, why don't we use it then um, as a painkiller?" Now, in 18, uh, uh, 1842, then William Clark used ether for tooth extraction, and Morton, who was also um, a dentist, actually um, used the same thing um, uh, a couple of years later at a hospital, because William Clark was just using it at home where the patients were having a problem. And because it was used at home, um, it was not really well known, but Morton knew Clark and then said, well, let's, uh, I do, bigger operations, reconstructing a or removing a jaw tumor in a hospital, and because it was done in a hospital, actually Morton got the credit for, for discovering ether as, a, as a anesthetic. Now chloroform was, uh, was discovered a little bit later, and the reason why that became even more popular, although it was more dangerous than ether, is because it was, it was used on Queen Victoria to help her get a painless delivery. Well, if it's good enough for the Queen, then it must be good enough for everybody. And it become, became very quickly very popular, even though it carried a lot more risks than Eden. A, a general surgeon by the name of McEwen then invented the endotracheal intubation, which we all consider perfectly normal. That when you operate somebody, he's intubated, so his airway stays open. But actually, that was only, uh, only discovered at the end of the, of the 19th century. And the same uh, person who was clearly inventive was also the first one to ever operate him in angioma. Um, and what is interesting, that even though the intubation, so where you secure your airway by inserting a tube in, uh, in, the, in, in, the larynx, uh, in the trachea, then basically only became routine in the 1960s. So up to then, people would get ether or would get chloroform, they would be way out and then the surgery would be done but that was not very controlled. So let's say an, an anesthesia was more or less under control. Then a Scottish guy by the name of Joseph Lister, he was, uh, he was um, interested in the fact that they used carbolic acid at a town dump to prevent putrefaction. And he said, well, if it's good to prevent putrefaction at a town dump, why don't I use it on wounds? I also prevent this putrefaction, this infection that we see on wounds. And so, basically, he said, I will use uh, this carbolic acid to remove my microbes from the skin and surgical instruments. And being a Scot, of course, this was developed in Scotland, and um, here it says that it's a poison, but that the antidote for carbolic acid is whiskey. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was developed in Scotland. If it would have been developed in Belgium, it would have been Geneva, which is a more local uh, drink over there. 
the, the anti-sepsis idea was that you could remove microbes from wounds and from surgical instruments came from another new idea, which was probably um, based on, which actually was old at that time even, because already in five, 1564, an Italian proposed that epidemic diseases are caused by transferable seed-like entities. So when the pest was going on, he was already thinking, well, this must be uh, transmitted even over long distance by very small, tiny, unseeable creatures that transmit the disease, which was a remarkable concept <coughs> at that time. About a hundred years later, uh, when uh, the microscope was developed, um, um, Anastasius Kircher actually described in uh, Bilbonic Plague that he saw microorganisms which he said these are responsible <coughs> for the plague. Um, and it was only later that von Leeuwenhoek actually described these microorganisms. So the idea of the, of the germ theory goes back to the 16th century, but was only shown um, that, they, that the idea was probably correct in, in, the, in, uh, in the 17th century. And uh, Simmelweis actually said, yeah, and, and this is important. The reason why is that if doctors do deliveries, actually more women die than if nurses, um, than if midwives do it. And the reason why is that the doctors would go to autopsies, did not wash their hand, then uh, do a, a vaginal touche to see how whether the woman would deliver or not without washing their hands. And he said, well, why don't you just wash your hands if you come from the autopsy table and when you go and investigate women? And he noticed that the mortality decreased from 18 to 2%, uh, which was similar to what uh, mortality was for midwives. Now, this brought actually uh, Pasteur, Louis Pasteur, uh, on an idea, and he said, well, if these microorganisms really can travel through the air, the microorganisms that were seen by Van Leeuwenhoek and by Kirchhoff, if they really exist and they're the cause for an infection, we have to be able to show it. And so what he did is he would boil um, a broth and wait, and there would be no growth of, of anything. Then he would boil, he would break the neck, and say, well, if they, these little creatures go through the air and go and sit in here, then they should uh, indeed get a growth. And that this is what happened. So this was an experiment to show that actually the, the idea was, um, was probably correct. And so based on that, uh, on, on these information that Lister got from, um, uh, from Pasteur, he said, well, if these creatures really fly through the air, even though we can't see them, then I have to protect the wound with a dressing, which was not done before, filled with carbolic acid, so the creatures can't get through the wound. And this actually reduced this putrefaction or infection dramatically. So it was a very practical approach to learning what other people had come up with. <coughs> now, asepsis is using uh, um, an aseptic technique, is, is using a technique of, um, uh, or a sterile technique in order to prevent infection, whereas antisepsis is what we would now call use antibiotics or use disinfection in order to uh, treat uh, microbes. This is uh, probably came from Germany, from Ernst von Bergmann, who was a, a general surgeon in, uh, in Berlin. And he actually introduced heat sterilization of his surgical instruments uh, based on also the idea of Louis Pasteur. Um, he also um, introduced a white coat, <coughs> which is not used in uh, New Zealand, but is, uh, is typically worn by doctors and surgeons in the rest of, um, of the world. Um, um, trying to keep that, uh, to keep dirty clothing from transmitting um, infections, and he was actually the f one of the first to say, "Well, we as surgeons, we should not be barbers anymore. We should be medical doctors." Because up to the up to 1800, <coughs> the barbers and the surgeons were in one guild, and the physicians were in one guild. So. Surgeons were barbers, they were not medical doctors. Whereas Bergman said, no, no, they should be medical doctors. And actually, even worse, the surgeons should decide 
whether or not somebody needed surgery, which was a completely new idea. Up to that moment, the physician, the doctor said to the barber, cut this out. Whereas back from back from said, no, 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 we have to be trained as doctors and we should, we should decide as, as doctor surgeons um, whether surgery is beneficial or not. Furthermore, <coughs> we really push the limits by saying, and, and surgeons should even be trained at the university, just like medical doctors, which was very new and was only occurring in Germany at that time. So, but in the United States, um, Hallstatt, who was the a primary surgeon who visited Bachmann, had introduced the same ideas in the United States by saying, okay, we as surgeons, we, we should be treated academically, and we should be medical doctors, and we should um, actually also have the same system as in Germany. We should have house surgeons, we should have registers, we should have a hierarchical build-up of how you uh, become a surgeon. So it was, it was a, a real change in ideas that surgeons were not just the barbers who were called by the physician to cut out something, but that there were independent thinking medical doctors who also performed surgery. Halstead was one of the first one in the United States, and um, he was in love with his truck nurse, which happens more commonly in hospitals. But <laughs> what happened is that she became allergic to um, antiseptic solutions like mer uh, mercury chloride <coughs> and carbolic acid. Her hands would not tolerate it. So what he said is, well, I love you. I want to keep operating with you. So I'll go to a, a, a company who makes rubber and I'll have some gloves made for you. So your hands, your hands as a scrub nurse, are protected from the patient, which is now really reversed, where we wear gloves, mostly to protect the patient from our hands. So the initial idea was that, uh, that uh, the gloves were there to protect the hands of his beloved scrub nurse, and it worked so well that they actually got married afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> McEwen, as I've mentioned before, the person who, who invented the endotracheal intubation, uh, operated the first meningioma and was the first also to apply anesthesia and antisepsis for brain operation. So in a certain way, being from Scotland as well, he was the first general surgeon to conduct modern neurosurgery with anesthesia and with, um, with uh, antisepsis. Now, most of us now find it perfectly normal that a neurosurgeon is trained at university, um, at least for his medical degree, and then goes on to become <coughs> a neurosurgeon um, and train in an academic way. But that was only done in Germany in the beginning. In the rest of the world, um, surgeons, general surgeons, initially were general practitioners who also did some surgery. And then some of them are crazy enough to even attempt brain surgery. But they often had were general physicians, general practitioners who did surgery. And some of them were really nuts, and they even attempted neurosurgery. So an academic neurosurgeon has a clinical job and a scientific or an academic job. Now the clinical job, as mentioned, <coughs> was based on being a barber, not, not a physician. And um, so there was one company of barber surgeons until 1800, that's very, very late. And so until the 1800s, surgeons were barbers. Now science were basically, that comes from witch doctors and alchemists. And uh, it's only since 1833 that um, we will uh, term the point of a scientist. So the witch doctors and the alchemists were working at universities. For example, Newton was the first so-called real physicist or real scientist, but he was still doing a lot of alchemy in his free time. So you've got the witch doctors and the alchemists, and you've got the barbers. Von Bergmann changed that and he, uh, he fused that and so in the United States a little later William, did William Halstead who had done on what they called the Grand Tour who had visited Europe because at that time Europe was ahead of the United States in everything so they, they traveled through Europe for a year uh, to visit the big uh, surgical centers and uh, William Halstead was uh, one of the first people actually to say forget general practice I'll only do surgery so 
Um, and he fused clinic and science. So he became the first professor of surgery at John Hopkins, and he was also the first chief surgeon in the hospital because he was both the professor and the surgeon. Remember that in the, in the Middle Ages, you got the anatomist, the academic, who was sitting on his throne reading Gallen, and it was the barber who was doing the surgery. Now here is, is the professor and the manual labor was the same guy, and that's why, of course, he could introduce this, act, this German academic system because he was in control both of the hospital and the university, whereas usually they were, they were separated. So he also uh, copied the German system from uh, using house surgeons and rest registrars and actually using physiology and pathology, not just anatomy, as a way of driving um, the, the surgical um, uh, routine. Uh, he was very interested in, asep in uh, aseptic techniques. As mentioned, he introduced uh, latex gloves for his, um, for his girlfriend and he very quickly adopted anesthesia, uh, which was good because he was a slow surgeon. So he was not one of these 2.3, uh, two and a half minute amputation surgeons. He was a slow surgeon, but very meticulous, very anatomical, following physiology and saying, well, if I don't create a lot of damage on the way in, then my results might be better. And indeed, um, when William Mayo, who founded the Mayo Clinic in the United States, visited Halstead, he said, well, incisions begin to heal at one end before Halstead was finished suturing at the other. <laughs> so he must have been very slow. <laughs> um, uh, like many of these innovators, he would try lots of things on himself. And, and, and indeed, he was using cocaine because uh, he noticed that cocaine had actually pain-killing effects. And he used it so much that he got addicted to it. So then they said, well, you can't continue like that. You should go to uh, a rehab. And he went to rehab. And what they did is they replaced cocaine by morphine. So for the rest of his life, he was addicted to morphine. <laughs> but he kept on being very <coughs> academically good and, and, and innovative. Uh, and actually, uh, he didn't die from his, um, from his uh, addiction. He was just addicted for the biggest part of his life. Uh, but apparently, it didn't cause too much problems. The reason why Halstead is important is because he trained Harvey Cushing. And Harvey Cushing is, of course, very important for neurosurgery. Now, the, initially, remember, you've got general practitioners who do general surgery, and these general surgeons, sometimes, the crazy ones, do neurosurgery. And uh, the problem was still mortality. 50% of the patients died uh, during or after surgery. Um, but because of applying anesthesia, because of applying antisepsis, because of applying asepsis, the mortality in a very relatively short time period dropped to, at that time, acceptable rates. Now 10% would still be unacceptable, but at that time it was very acceptable. And the first, first surgeon who was appointed to only treat neurological diseases was Victor Horsley in, um, in London. So he was officially the first neurosurgeon. And um, in the United States, a little bit later, Harvey Cushing had to convince his, his trainer, Halstead, that he said, I want to do neurosurgery. He said, well, we don't need that. Anyway, they die. Uh, all of them die anyway. So why would, we, why would we waste your talent on becoming a neurosurgeon? But finally, he did become a neurosurgeon. And he is he's now called the father of modern neurosurgery. For New Zealand, uh, we had to wait a little longer, 40 years longer, but that's still early to get the first neurosurgeon. Now, Harvey Cushing, who was trained by Halstead, was also slow. Well, he had learned it from somebody to be slow, uh, but meticulous. And he also took over this idea from Halstead, what Halstead had gotten from the German, from, uh, from Bergmann, to really do academic surgery, use antisepsis, asepsis, and anesthesia. I mean, use modern neurosurgical techniques. And he reported an operative mortality of 7%, uh, which was a lot better than at that time was present in Europe. So the United States, even though they got all everything from Europe, actually, because of this academic system that they introduced more generally, and Europe was only in Germany, um, their results became a lot uh, better. So. Um, 
Harvey Cushing also went for uh, a wander. Yeah, he also went did a ground tour, went to see other people, and he visited the UK and Germany. And of course, he went to see Victor Horsley. And James Fulton, the neurophysiologist, actually who did the first lobotomies on monkeys, which were then later done by Monitz and popularized by Walter Freeman, uh, Fulton wrote a biography of Harvey Cushing, and in there he writes, he found Horsley living in seemingly great confusion, dictating letters during breakfast to a male secretary, patting dogs between letters, and operating like a wild man. <laughs> Cushing watched Horsley do an excision of a gassier in Berlin <coughs> in a great fury in a private mansion, and was out of the house in less than an hour after he entered it. He felt that refinements of neurological surgery could not be learned from Horsley. Now, removing a gassier in Gandhian, which is fairly deep in your brain, and within an hour, in a private home of somebody, I don't think can still be done right now. <laughs> so Victor Horsley was clearly a wild madman and very fast. He was still of the school, fast is good. Now, um, whereas uh, Cushing was slow, um, but he also said, well, actually, a trained neurosurgeon must be his own experimental neuroscientist. So he has to be an academic surgeon so we can learn and improve what we do. And he founded the Society of Neurological Surgeons, which means at that time, neurosurgery becomes a different dis discipline. It's not part of general surgery anymore. Neurosurgery from the 1920s is a separate discipline. <coughs> so of course, the first neurosurgeons were uh, uh, what people said, well, it's the ha half mad being operated by the mad which is probably referring to Victor Horsley. And um, this is an old um, painting by uh, Hieronymus Boss, The Stone of Madness, where people believe that there was a stone in the head which created mental disease and that you should um, operate um, these stones and then people would get better. But if you look at the, at the painting, I don't know if this is a real normal head, so the surgeon is probably worse than the patient himself. And this is also what Foucault wrote in one of his books, that indeed uh, the surgeon is probably uh, worse than a patient that is being operated. Now the scientists are also often considered mad scientists. And if you look in, um, in movies, in 30% of the movies, the scientist is a villain, and in only 11% it's a hero. So if you're, as a, as a neurosurgeon, you're considered half mad, and as a scientist you're considered half mad, but that's not a good starting point for choosing neurosurgery as, an, as a career. Now clinically, it was also mentioned that, uh, and this is by uh, Douglas Miller, Australia's first neurosurgeon, so it has to be true, because it's from locally uh, mentioned, that <laughs> neurosurgery is the pursuit of the impossible by the irrepressible. <laughs> which shows a little bit the, the personality, the typical personality of these initial neurosurgeons. Um, and scientists then ultimately had to change alchemy into uh, electricity. Now alchemy says uh, that we can turn metals into gold, which most of us, except maybe some physicists, might say, this is crazy, you can't turn metal into gold. However, with the linear accelerator and Glenn Seaborg, who, who was a Nobel laureate, actually did create gold by um, um, sending uh, x-rays to, um, to bismuth, and as a side product, gold was created. Unfortunately, the experiment is so expensive that the gold that you get is not worth it, <laughs> but it's pure alchemy. So alchemy exists, at least if you have the equipment to do it. Now, alchemy has to be become replaced by, by uh, electricity. And electricity was first used in, in, by Galvani in 1786, and he was using frog legs in public displays by uh, tire current stimulation. And he had a nephew by the name of Galvani, and uh, by the name of Aldini, and Aldini did the same thing but on decapitated criminals, also in public, showing that if you stimulate um, part, of the, part of the nerves or the, uh, um, in the head, the eyes would move or, or the arms would move. So that was really done in public, and then a writer by the name of, um, of Shelley said, oh, well, these experiments of Aldini, I'll write a book about it, and that's how the book of Frankenstein actually came to be. That was based on these experiments of the first use of electricity. 
And then as mentioned, Bartolo was the first to use this intraoperatively in humans. Now clinically, um, the problem is what, um, that neurosurgery might actually be in, into a problem because more and more tumors are becoming radiated or treated with, uh, with chemotherapy, so they don't need us manual laborers anymore um, and except probably for neuromodulation. A neuromodulation basically means that you induce neuroplastic changes, which means that the brain is not a hardwired computer, it can adjust itself to changes in the environment. And this is why we can learn. If, we, if our brain would not be plastic, would not be capable of changing its structure and function to external stimuli, well, we would not be able to learn. So, neuromodulation basically means you put an electrode somewhere in the brain, you activate these uh, neurons or these brain cells, which changes the connectivity, the connections between all those brain cells, and this changes whole networks, and then these networks um, have an emergent function, so a function that develops from a network. So conceptually, you have to see that all pieces of a car are not a car. You have to put all those pieces of a car together in a very specific way to get a functioning car. In the same way, so the emergent property of all these pieces of a car is a functional car depending on the connectivity of these different pieces. And in the same way, in our brain, all these different parts of the brain create an emergent function, which could be consciousness, which could be pain, which could be any uh, an action, a thought, is hypothesized to be the same thing. It's a connectivity that creates the emergent function. Now, using neuromodulation, using electrical or magnetic stimuli, you can then um, create a change in the network which will change the emergent function. And that depends on a lot of parameters which are not that very important. Now, neuromodulation consists of different um, aspects. Uh, you can have non-surgical or non-invasive and surgical modulation, uh, magnetic stimuli, electrical stimuli that comes in different forms, or neurofeedback where you put on an EG cap and then you measure the electrical activity of the brain and you say, well, it has to be like this because that's what we know it is in healthy people. And then you give positive feedback, for example, a movie that plays when it's in the correct, uh, when it's the correct activity. When it's not correct activity, the movie stops and you will want to see, continue seeing the movie. So your brain will actually down train or up train to get to what uh, we define as normal activity. And electroconvulsive uh, therapy is also a way of non-invasive uh, neuromodulation. And then you have surgical modulation where you basically implant electrodes in the brain or the spinal cord or on the peripheral nerve. Magnetic stimulation, you use a magnetic coil. Uh, as you can tell, it's not very refined. You send a magnetic pulse through the skull because the skull doesn't stop a magnetic wave. And that goes down to the brain. You can use TEN stimulation, it stands for trans electrical nerve stimulation. You can use direct current, alternating current or random noise electrical stimulation, uh, ECT or neurofeedback. With implants, you've got uh, basically uh, for the brain, you've got a pacemaker. Uh, brain stimulators are derived from pacemakers um, and that is connected to a lead which you implant somewhere on the, uh, in the nervous uh, system. There is a lot of approved indications, but as you can see, the future is what's going to drive neuromodulation. So where we're losing a lot of work in the tumor field, in the vascular field, probably the future of neurosurgery, and this is why we look at the history, is going to be um, in, um, in neuromodulation techniques. Um, so it is on the rise, the amount of implants, but uh, the most successful one is the cochlear implant. The cochlear implant is by far the most successful. Spinal cord stimulation is also performed uh, quite a lot for, uh, for suppression of pain, but also uh, somewhat for spasticity. And then, of course, Parkinson's disease, etc., cetera, um, and vagal nerve stimulation is performed. And now more and more uh, sacral nerve stimulation, so where you stimulate nerves that actually go to your leg or, or go to... Uh, the con to control your bladder um, are being used more and more as well. Companies are very interested because it's a very wealthy market. If you consider that an average uh, internal pulse generator or pacemaker costs between thirty and forty thousand dollars, 
and an elector of $2,000, well, as a company, you can still become very wealthy by finding new indications and new stimulation designs. Now, the question is, is this new? I mean, it sounds very interesting. You need a base maker. No, it's not new. Actually, the Egyptians used the electrical catfish to treat headaches and neuralgia. Just put the catfish on the head <laughs> and then wait until it gave an electrical shock and that improved the headache. So did the Greeks, but they used another fish, and so did the Romans. And actually, um, Scribonius Largus described how he used the electrical torpedo fish to treat um, headaches and rheumatism of the Emperor Claudius. So it's not new, it's been, it's been used forever. Of course, if you look at the pacemakers now, what we can do is we can, we can control the amplitude. We can say, well, we want a little more or a little less of electrical stimulation. So how did the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Romans do that? By choosing different sizes of fish. <laughs> Small fish were a little bit of electrical stimulation or a lot of it. So they also had actually almost the same methodology as we had, but it was alive. So the neurosurgery of the future depends again on technical innovations not only on new ideas. So it might be more Gallison-like than Kuhnian-like. And for example, uh, functional imaging has dramatically improved what we can do. Here you see a fiber tracts and a tumor next to it, uh, because if you see that, you don't see uh, the, this fiber tract could be pushed to that side or to this side or to the back side. If you can see where, then you know, well, I shouldn't operate from there because I will cut and the patient will be hemiplegic if I come from the top here, that will, be, that will limit the risks of being hemiplegic. So this, not, this novel technology, um, as you can see here, another tumor and then lots of different fiber tracks that go around, or here fMRI, where you have a, a patient um, move his, uh, his right hand in the scanner, and then that lights up, and that shows that actually this area, which is normally one area, is pushed um, laterally and medially, and so that, that tells you, well, for surgery you should come from the front, be very careful there, and be very careful there. So it improves the surgical outcomes because of new technology. You can see better where functions are located in the brain. But of course you have to know where this is in the brain, and that's why they develop neuro neuronavigation. Neuronavigation is nothing more than a GPS system. A GPS system that tells us exactly where we are in the brain, and then we can look, we can see when we're here, and that will allow us to operate more in a safer way. And then there is CUSA that are developed, which is a, a machine that you can see uh, in the back. And a CUSA is basically an ultrasound aspirator. So it creates ultrasound, which which um, creates damage to the tumor, and then it is aspirated. So there is new technology that actually allows us to be safer. But you can develop new technology because everybody's going to be radiated. The new technology is, of course, not going to be of a lot of value. Because with radiation, um, this is a gamma knife. This, is, this looks like a CT scan. But actually, it's a, it's, a, it's a lead helmet with more than 200 little holes in it. And through each hole, there is uh, some a radiation going, which is centered on the tumor. So you can create a very high field uh, just locally by and, and the, the, the uh, x-rays are basically not going all through the same part otherwise you, you might create um, just a hole a trajectory where the, where the rays went through. So I was talking about neurosurgery, the history and I'm almost saying that it's over that you don't need neurosurgeons anymore because you've got vascular uh, endovascular treatments of aneurysms and a AVMs where they go into the into your blood vessel with a catheter and then uh, eject glue into your brain. So uh, is this the end of neurosurgery because this is not being uh, performed anymore? And are we also at the end of science? Uh, are we at the end of what we can understand of the brain? We're probably not at the end of neurosurgery because we've got one luck, and that's that the big pharma is not interested in the brain anymore. The reason is that um, even though about $80 billion a year can be earned by treating uh, brain disease, uh, the development of medication has 50% less chance of making it to the market and costs 30% more than, for example, medication for the heart. 
So 85% of the drugs that are developed for brain disease never reach the market. Now, so it, it has become too expensive because creating a drug costs in between three and five billion dollars. If it doesn't make it to the market in 85% of the chances, you're wasting a lot of money. So the big pharma has basically said, not interested anymore. We don't make any, any new drugs for the brain because, and since 2011, Glux, uh, Smith, uh, uh, Glaxo, Smith, Klein, AstraZeneca, Novartis, all the big companies have either stopped doing neuroscientific research or have just outsourced it um, to startups and say, well, if you find something, we'll buy you. It's cheaper to buy you if you're, um, for lots of money, we'll buy you if you do all the, all the risky work. So uh, why, does, why does medication not work anymore for the brain? Because there's still this belief in a magic bullet that one drug will cure everything and there is a lack of understanding of the brain. There is still a lack, a lack of this academic part, this neuroscientific part, and the solution, of course, is one of the solutions could be to reverse engineer the brain. So, and this is, um, so you've got molecules that form synapses, uh, which are part of neurons, which are then part of networks, which then form maps and systems, and then create a whole brain. So can we create a whole brain? That's the question. And there's a lot of money that is being spent now to decode the human connectome. All these connections that create emerging properties. In Europe, one billion euro is spent on the human brain project. The USA, one billion dollar for the brain research project. And they'll probably work, have to work together because if you compare it, for example, to the uh, human genome project, which was about 3.8 billion dollars, we'll need a little bit more money in order to be able to create a brain from the petri dish all the way to creating, recreating a, uh, a brain. So this is why for neurosurgery, neuromodulation is so important because it's an alternative for the disappearance of medication. So we have to better understand the brain, translate that clinically, and uh, then of course we have to collaborate with bioethicists to see how far we can go uh, with what we do with philosophers and with uh, medical lawyers. So for, I'll give you a very practical example of how this could work. You have a patient with phantom pain, you put them in a scanner and you look where the pain is located in the brain. You then use one uh, by using one of these uh, functional techniques and there's multiple different techniques. You can then use a non-invasive stimulation and if that works, you can implant an electrode. So that's a very simple stepwise approach to try and treat these, um, these um, techniques. So, for example, this is a TMS machine that tries to target this um, abnormal uh, pathological idea which is uh, involved in, for example, addiction. You can then look at the connections because it's the connections that create the problem. Um, and uh, you can try and treat that connection and if that works, then you can implant an electrode, as you can see here on post-operative x-ray, um, and here in, in, in a brain, in order to treat addiction or pain or whatever, OCD, whatever you're trying to treat. So in summary, it has been suggested that Parkinson's disease has gone through different phases in order to, uh, to come to its current treatment. In phase one, there was not a lot of knowledge and large lesions are made with suboptimal results. Well, you cut the spinal cord. If you, if you have a tremor on one side, you cut the spinal cord or you, you remove the motor cortex. And of course the tremor is gone, but you can't use your hand and function and, and leg function is also gone. This is um, a second phase is then where you have better target localization, for example, by using this neuro navigation, the stereotactic technique, uh, which permits smaller lesion making with better results. And then in the third phase, when medication comes up, well, only the difficult cases are being treated surgically. And now in the fourth phase, actually, this is probably replaced by replaceable by removable implants. And the same holds for mental disorders, where initially, because we didn't know a lot, they were doing large frontal lobotomies with suboptimal results and many side effects. In the second phase, because people understood better what was going on, they made smaller lesions, for example, stereotactic symptomatomies, which improves the result with less side effects. And after the introduction of a medication, just like in, like in Parkinson's disease, only the treatment resistant people are becoming operated by um, implants uh, in the fourth phase. So in conclusion, neurosurgery is a very old profession. It requires 
neuroscientific knowledge, which, uh, which after um, the development of the universities came, was, uh, was uh, taught at university. And this neuroscientific knowledge entailed anatomy, but also the function, where, where, is, uh, where in the anatomy is the function localized. And, of course, it required the evolution from alchemy to electricity. Whereas it also required an evolution in surgical techniques. Um, and, of course, the development of anesthesia and infection control was crucially important for the development of, of what we could call modern neurosurgery. Surgeons had to evolve from barbers to surgeon and then from surgeon to neurosurgeon, becoming a separate entity. New technology now permits new treatments, uh, both the technology used to better visualize what's happening in the brain as to know where exactly we are in the brain, uh, because it's very easy to lose your way once you're uh, inside the brain, and this new technology allows you not to get lost. And so the classical neurosurgery actually might become less important because of new technology that says, well, you don't need to operate these lesions anymore. Uh, but neuromodulation, therefore, will likely become more and more important and <coughs> might uh, mean that neurosurgery is here at least to stay for a little while. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you.